It is so good to be loud. So good to see each and every one of you here today. Thankful for each of you. I, I, I can't tell you enough how, how important every one of you is to our family. And uh, I, just, I just want to tell you how much we appreciate you all. How thankful we are for the last four, almost and a half years uh, that we've got to be here with you. You have been an absolute blessing to us and our family. And uh, I wish that I had time to go individually to each of you and tell you what you mean to us. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I don't. And you know, I really struggled about what I should do with this lesson. Uh, do, I, do I say some things that I want to say to each of you and, uh, and try to get through that? Or uh, do I just kind of keep going down the same path that we've been on? And I, I decided that I would leave somebody out. I would miss something. I probably would be a blubbering fool by the time it was over. So I decided I just want to preach the gospel this morning. Uh, hopefully what I've been able to do for the last four and a half years, I just want to do that again with you today. As we look again at our series of lessons that we've entitled Each One Reach One. Because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be disciple makers who make disciples. And if each one of us would just reach one other person every year. Listen to this. If each one of us just reach one person every year, and that person that we reach one person, reach one person. If you did that just for 30 years, one person reaching one person, and those two reaching one person, and those two reaching one person. Do you realize that in 30 years, over one billion people would come to Jesus Christ? It's amazing, that this, this, this network marketing, if you want to call it that, this, this, this law of great returns. It's what happens when we, when we get serious about the gospel. And I hope that that's exactly what we can do, that we can, we can be people who make disciples. As most of you knew, no, I grew up on a border town. Yuma, Arizona is located about 10 to 15 minutes from the American-Mexican border and right on the California border. I lovingly refer to it as the armpit of the world. And that's a great place to be from, let me tell you that, because, because it is dreadfully hot. In fact, I think it was 108 there yesterday, and that's nothing. I mean, it's going to be 118 by the time the summer finishes. So again, great place to be from. And one of the things that, I, that, that aggravated me is that, you know, growing up in a border town, there was a lot of Spanish that was being spoken all around me. And I took a couple years of Spanish in high school, but I never really grasped the language. I know muy poquito Spanish, Espanol. And so I, I, can catch a, I can catch a few words here and there. I can catch a, maybe every fourth word. And I really, really wish I had paid more attention and I had really worked at learning a second language because there's great value in being able to speak multiple languages. In fact, Jesus, as we will see in our text, Matthew chapter 15, if you have your Bibles, uh, it, Jesus in our text spoke multiple languages. And what we're about to see is Jesus, for the first time, going outside of Palestine. Jesus leaves his familiar surroundings, and when he does, he engages a Gentile woman. Now, you need to know that in that culture and at that time, that was an absolute no-no. You did not do that. But Jesus not only engages her, he's able to speak with her and talk with her in her own tongue, in her own native language. And no one could have expected what happened next to someone that everyone thought was a no one. Let me say that again. No one could have expected what happened next to someone that everyone thought was a no one. Look with me, Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. Matthew 15, 21. And Jesus went away from there, and he withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman, wow, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon, but he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she's crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Now, does that story bother you just a little bit? It bothers me just a little bit 
Now, I think it's important to remember that this is a woman, and this is a Canaanite woman. I think it's important to remember that Canaanites are the absolute enemies of Israel. In fact, they had at this point been enemies of Israel for over 2,000 years. And that's who this woman is. She is an enemy of Israel. But in spite of that, as I read this, it just appears that Jesus is a little rude to her. I mean, it seems so unchristlike. <laughs> Here's this, this woman who has a great burden for her child who comes up to Jesus, and Jesus doesn't even talk to her. And I understand she's the wrong gender, she's the wrong race, and she has the wrong faith, but why does Jesus initially give her the silent treatment? This story has always bothered me. And then I started thinking about it. Every time I got a test when I was in school, and every time I'm sure you got a test when you were in school, I bet the teacher didn't say a whole lot, did they? They were very, very quiet when the test was being given. And I think that's what's going on here in this story. Jesus is giving a test. And the first thing that he's testing is he's testing this Canaanite woman's faith in him. The first thing he's doing is testing her faith in him. No one would have expected this woman to model the kind of faith that everyone needed to have. But that's exactly what she did. In fact, the story ends with Jesus praising her. And literally, the word that he uses to describe her faith is mega. You've heard of mega malls, mega churches, mega this, mega that. Well, this woman, Jesus says, has mega faith. And I want to ask that question this morning. What does it look like to have mega faith? What, what, what is that? And I think there are several things that I want to point you to because I hope that's what we can all develop is this amazing mega faith. And so the first thing about mega faith you need to know this morning is that mega faith has the right object. It worships the right thing. And that which is the right object is none other than Jesus Christ. Mega faith has the right object, and that object is Jesus. This woman, this Canaanite woman, this enemy of Israel, calls Jesus Lord. She calls him the son of David, which is a messianic title. And she brings him more than honor. She brings him homage. She brings him worship. Matthew chapter 25 uses that same word we saw a few weeks ago with the demon-possessed man who comes and falls at Jesus' feet. And so this woman comes in front of all of her peers. And you need to know that the place where Jesus is is extremely immoral. It's extremely wicked. I mean, there is sexual activity going on everywhere. This is thunder from down under on steroids. I mean, there's a whole lot of problems going on in the Canaanite region. And these people who worship all these other gods, these people who, who, who are so ridiculously immoral, in the midst of all of them, she worships. She falls at his feet and she worships. And the implication here is that she keeps worshiping him even though he's not even responding to her. He's not saying a word, yet she continues to worship. That's what mega faith does. Not only does it have the right object, number two, mega faith perseveres. This woman is not getting the answer she wants, but she doesn't give, a, give up. And that's what mega faith does. Mega faith hangs in there with God, even when it doesn't feel like God is listening. Now, Jesus finally speaks, and he seems to say to this woman, you have the right God, but you're just here at the wrong time. He says to her, I'm sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, we know that Jesus' earthly ministry was very, very brief. It was only three years long. And he focused on establishing the foundations of his kingdom among the people that God had prepared, the Jews. And so Jesus told the woman at the well, remember in John 4, that salvation was from the Jews. We remember chapter 1 of verse 16 of Romans, where the power of the gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This was the strategy of God. And you may not like the strategy, but it doesn't change the fact that this was God's idea. In the book of Acts, all the time, where do they go first? They go to the Jews, they go to the synagogues, they go there and they preach before they move on to the Gentiles. Jesus says to this woman, my mission is to Israel. Now, 
if you're a Jew and you thought of Gentiles like this woman, there was a word that you would use to describe these foreigners, especially these pagan Canaanites. It was the word dog. And the word picture here is not some nice little friendly pet dog that runs around like we have at our houses. That's not what we're talking about here. The word picture that that we have is this old junkyard dog. It's a scary dog. It's a vicious dog. This is the kind of word that the Jews would use to describe those who were not like them. But that's not the word Jesus uses here when he mentions dog. Jesus says it's not right to give the bread at the table, bread that is for the children, to the dogs. Now, very important lesson here. Jesus doesn't use the word for junkyard dog. He uses the word for house pet dog. And this may be foreign to us, but listen, in that culture, they didn't have dish rags. They didn't have napkins. And so what you did is you ate with your hands. And as you did, your hands would naturally get a little greasy or whatever. And then you would take some bread and you would use the bread to wipe your hands. And when you wiped your hands with the bread, then you would put that bread on the floor for the little house pets. And so when Jesus says to her, Uh, You need to know that when Jesus says that to her, he's actually veiling a promise. He's veiling a promise. He's actually saying to this woman, not some derogatory statement as it appears. He's saying to her, listen, you're going to get to eat, but you're just not going to eat first. Now, this mega faith woman jumps on the promise of Jesus Christ. She claims that promise, and then she says this, but Lord... It is okay. It is right for you to give something to me. I'm not asking you to change your plans. I'm just saying that even house pets receive kindness from the master. And Jesus had to have grinned ear to ear when he heard that because she understood. She got it. And that leads me to the last thing about mega faith. It's this. Mega faith expects. There's an expectation with someone who has mega faith. This woman, against all evidence against her, says, I know that you are good, and that I know you intend to give bread to the world. By the way, side note, this is for free. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which means house of bread. He is the bread of life born in the house of bread. Just throw that out there for free. Isn't that amazing what God does? Jesus grinned from ear to ear because this mega faith of this woman had to have been mega pleasing, pleasing to him. In fact, only two times in the gospel does Jesus say someone has great faith. And both times, the people to whom he refers are Gentiles. Remember the Roman centurion soldier? He says, I have people under me. I say to one, go and go, and they do it. I understand. I believe that you can do the same thing. And Jesus says, wow, I've never seen such faith, not even in all of Israel. And so the two times Jesus says, this is mega faith, are to people who aren't even a part of the covenant community. And no one would have expected them to have this kind of faith. Jesus is giving a test, and the woman passes the test with flying colors, but she's not the only one getting a test that day. The second thing going on is Jesus is testing his apostles. He's testing their love for them. You know who them are, right? Jesus is testing his apostles' love for them. You need to realize that this story in Matthew 15 follows the most controversial sermon Jesus had ever preached. If you read about chapter, the first part of chapter 15, the Pharisees begin asking Jesus about traditions. Uh-oh, there's that word. Why don't you wash your hands before you eat, they say. And Jesus immediately challenges their hypocrisy and why they make a bunch of rules that God never made. Sound familiar? And then it's as if he draws all the crowd together and Jesus says something that absolutely rocked their world. He says, it's not what you do on the outside that makes you unclean. It's what you do on the inside that makes you unclean. Oh, I'd love to chase that rabbit. We don't have time. You see, that thing that is keeping you far from God is not what you're doing on the outside. It's what's going on inside. It's what's in your soul. It's your priorities. That, Jesus says, is what has to get clean first. It's not the outside that God cares about as much. It's the inside. 
And right after that, Jesus intentionally takes his only trip outside of Palestine. He takes his disciples intentionally to them land. Let's go outside of the walls of our kingdom to see what's going on in them land. He wants to see if they understood what he had just preached to those Jews. He wanted to see if they would advocate for someone who was unclean on the outside, but was very clean on the inside. How'd they do? Well, we know verse 23, don't we? Send her away! We don't want anything to do with her. Send her away, they say. Epic fail of the test. And I wonder how many times we fail the exact same test. We send people away that Jesus wants to be brought near. Thankfully, Jesus didn't give up on them, and he doesn't give up on us when we do the same thing. He continues to penetrate and plant this radical idea in their hearts, and hopefully in ours as well. And here's what he wants us to know. No one is them to God. No one. No one is them to God. And it's not long after this that Jesus is going to give the parable of the Good Samaritan. Isn't that interesting how this all fits together? One of his most radical parables he gives right after this, not long after that. And it's radical because to the Jew, there is no such thing as a good Samaritan. And the whole point of this parable is for you and I to open our eyes to the possibility that them may just be our neighbor. Them may just be the ones that we're supposed to engage, the ones that we're supposed to reach out to. Now, let's get a little edgy. Can we do that this morning? If Jesus told the story today, who would the neighbor be? Think about that with me for a second. It wouldn't have any power or punch if Jesus were here today. He wouldn't tell the parable of the Good Samaritan because we have no, no way to relate that, right? So who would he use today? He could use a lot of people, couldn't he? He could use a prostitute or a Chippendale dancer, for goodness sake. He could use whoever he wanted that would get us a little crazy. For some of you, the, the Samaritan may be the neighbor. The neighbor might be the, the, the one who's on welfare. The one whose skin is darker than yours. That very well may be the Samaritan that he would use if he were telling the story today. For some of you, the neighbor might be a guy with a dip in his mouth and a pickup whose skin is a whole lot whiter than yours. And maybe his neck's a little bit redder. For some, the neighbor would, would have been someone who voted Democrat. And for others, it would have been someone who voted Republican. Maybe, maybe the neighbor Jesus would use would have been someone who lives in this country illegally. But I guarantee if Jesus were telling the story today, Instead of a Samaritan, he would use someone who would be an absolute challenge to you. So who is it for you? It would be someone you find it very, very, very difficult to love. But here's what the parable of the Good Samaritan says to me. It says this. It says, you and I have never met anybody from anywhere that God doesn't love and that God doesn't want to find Jesus. This is what the parable of the Good Samaritan says. This is what Matthew 15 and this parable or the story of the Canaanite woman say. You have never met anyone from anywhere that God doesn't love and doesn't want to bring into his kingdom. Period. And if you and I are going to have mega faith, and if we're going to help produce mega faith in Jesus, then we're going to have to embrace his mega vision for the entire world. Here's what Jesus says. Remember John chapter 10, verse 16? He says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I've got to bring them in also. Do you remember that? Jesus' heart beats for everyone. Not just you and not just people that look like you and think like you and vote like you. His heart beats for everyone. And so I want to tell you three lessons that I think we learn from Matthew chapter 15. 
Three things Jesus wanted to teach us. Here's number one. Someone is hungry. Someone around you is longing for the bread that falls from the master's table. Someone is hungry. Don't you dare stereotype who is capable of having mega faith and who isn't. Because you might be surprised of someone who is starving for a crumb. Desperation will do that to us. I've said before, death, divorce, and disaster, the three Ds are things that open us up to Jesus like nothing else. Desperation does that. This woman had her God, and she had her house of worship, but she reached a place in her life where every other thing she turned to failed to deliver. And there is a time when someone that you know who's just going to be struggling they're going to they're gonna say, I have cancer, I have crazy things going on in my family, I have financial struggles, I have questions that what I've been relying on can't answer anymore. And in that moment, you're going to have an opportunity to give them some bread from the master's table. You're going to have the opportunity to help them find food. We all know people who look like there would be no way in the world they would ever consider Jesus. And maybe they've been trained to be that way. Maybe they've trained to be defiant. But whatever, there's something in the pit of their stomach that's telling them there's something more. There's something more. And that's what we have to keep our eyes open to. Listen to John chapter 6 and verse 51. The text says this, I am the living bread. Verse Brorn, he's born in Bethlehem, house of bread. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Did you catch that? He says, I've come to give my body so that the world may have life. The whole world. Jesus died so that the whole world could be fed. Not just you, not just me, the whole world. And no one who is hungry is turned away from Jesus' table. Are you hearing me today? No one who is hungry is turned away from Jesus' table. And so don't you dare turn anyone away either. Don't do it because someone is hungry. And number two, here's a great thing truth that we learn, not only uh, from the parable of the Good Samaritan, but from this story in Matthew chapter 15. Anyone, anyone is welcome. Anyone is welcome. And I just wonder how many times we act like there are certain ones that God cannot reach with his love. I wonder. Here's the reality. The greatest faith is often found in the one we would have least expected to even have faith in the first place. What matters is not what's going on on the outside. What matters is what is going on on the inside. We know John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that whoever... Did you hear that? Whoever... Reminds me of my basketball days when I was in Arizona and we were playing basketball. You know, we'd come together before a game and we'd have a little cheer that you do, right? Defense on three, one, two, three. Well, we didn't have defense. We said whoever. Whoever on three, one, two. And what we're saying, it doesn't matter who we play. We're going to win that game. That's what we thought. We didn't, but that's what we were thought. Right? Whoever. Doesn't matter. Put anybody in front of us, we're going to go win. Jesus says it doesn't matter. Whoever. I love even them. Remember the song, All Things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. Come feast upon the word of God and thou shalt be richly fed. Hear the invitation. Come whosoever will. Here's the irony. We often sing that song, but we don't really mean it. Because far too often our attitudes show that there are some people we would rather stay away from. And there are some people we would rather have stay away from our church. You know, those people. Those people. But Christianity is a whosoever will conviction. And what that means is anyone is welcome. And here's what drives me insane. We have so much us versus them language in our world and in our church. It's not even funny. We have us and them language with, with those who are outside of Christ. 
We have us and them language with those that attend a different church than we do. We even have us and them language within our own fellowship. It's insane. We often see people far from God as threats. But God is shouting in our ears, no, they aren't threats. They're opportunities for you to invite them to come to the table. And it shouldn't matter what anyone looks like to someone who wants to look like Jesus. And that's the real question. Do you really want to look like Jesus? Because if you really want to look like Jesus, you may just have to change who you're hanging out with, at least a little bit. And you may have to open yourself up to the possibility that there's someone who's hungry, who's welcome at the table that you've been ignoring that now needs to be embraced with the love of Jesus Christ and transformed into his image one degree of glory at a time. Here's the third truth. Everyone is us. Everyone is us. There is no them in the kingdom of God. There's no them. I hate the segregation that happens. The church is sometimes the most segregated place on Sunday morning. Drives me insane. What is that all about? No one is them in the kingdom of God. And listen to this. Have you ever thought, have you ever thought that we, we were them to the people Jesus was sent to? Do you understand that this morning? We were the outcasts. We were the ones who were far away. We were the ones that they didn't want anything to do with. But because of Jesus Christ, the doors were thrown open wide, even to people like us. Gentiles, sinners, losers. No one is them in the kingdom of God. You see, grace trumps heritage. Listen to me now. The point of this sermon is not to say that heritage is unimportant. No, be proud of your heritage. But listen, heritage doesn't get anyone into heaven, and heritage won't keep anyone out of hell. And if you think that simply because you're attending a building with church on Christ on the door, that that guarantees your salvation, you better think again. Heritage does not guarantee heaven, and it doesn't keep anyone out of hell. Everyone needs the bread of life. Everyone. This is why Jesus gives us the commission in Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations, all of them, every ethnic race, every tribe, all of it, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and I'm with you even to the end of the age. We hear all the time about how much the church is in trouble. And I think we hear that for good reason. It's true that the church in North America, and even worse, in Europe, is absolutely struggling. But did you know that the church is flourishing in other places? Yeah, the center of Christianity may no longer be in America, but that doesn't mean that God is dead. It doesn't mean that he's tired. It doesn't mean he's retired or out of business. Did you know that right now there are more Anglicans in Nigeria than there are in Europe and North America combined. Did you know, this one's near and dear to my heart, did you know that in Nepal, there are now 400,000 evangelical Christians in Nepal. And 70 years ago, there wasn't even one. 400,000 have come to Jesus in 70 years. Do you know that at Yale... Yale University, the Campus Crusade for Christ. Did you know that 85% of those who are a part of that organization are Asian? Isn't that amazing? And did you know that right now there are 15,000 missionaries in Great Britain and the overwhelming majority of them are African? They are us. They are us. And get this. 16,000 people a day. Listen, 16,000 people a day in China are becoming followers of Jesus Christ. 16,000 every single day. I hear people worried about the state of the church, but listen, someone is going to teach your grandchildren about Jesus Christ. 
God may send them from China. He may send them from Iran or Mexico or even California. But there is room at the table for everyone. Remember that them is us and us is them. There's room at the table for all, even you. Even you. I love you very, very much. And I pray God's blessings will flow and pour down on your hearts and your heads and that the increase that God is going to give as each one of us reach one of us is going to be so beyond anything we could possibly imagine. And, and I pray with all my heart that you will be Jesus to this world around you, to this community around you. And until we meet again, may God bless you, may he make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Let's stand together and sing.